Yeah, so, so why did you write a book on Beatitudes? I have no idea. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. That's not... Okay. So I'll start over. You said I didn't write it. God wrote it. Yeah, God wrote it. Asshole. And therefore, you have to buy it. <laughs> God wrote it. Hello, I'm Paul Lewis Metzger, and I'm professor of Christian Theology and Theology of Culture at Multnomah University and Seminary in Portland, Oregon. I also direct Multnomah University's Institute for Cultural Engagement, New Wine, New Wineskins. And I'm the author of The Beatitudes, Not Platitudes, Jesus' Invitation to the Good Life. We can never get enough of Jesus' words. The longest sermon of Jesus' in the Bible, in the New Testament, is the Sermon on the Mount, and it starts out with the Beatitudes. And I wish there were more and more books written on the Beatitudes in our day because so often we're not really accounting for its message. There are many reasons why I think people pass over the Beatitudes. One reason is that some think that it's simply for the nation of Israel back then in the day. Or for some, it's so high in its ideals that it can't be lived out. They're just moral maxims to account for just by way of thinking about but not to live out. And third, because of the prosperity gospel, we so often will go around the Beatitudes or transform their message to individualize and privatize them in such a manner that they were not really getting at the heart of Jesus. And while Jesus wants us to bring it home to our heart uh, individually and personally, it has far more significance than simply that. That's important, but there's also how it transforms our whole orientation toward life in community and our society as a whole. And when Jesus speaks forth the Beatitudes, it's an invitation, it's his State of the Union address for his kingdom. And he's saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are meek, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. This is what's entailed in being involved in his kingdom. And he invites us to participate in this countercultural and upside down kingdom which never gets old and which is always new. And Jesus invites us today to join him in his kingdom mission. You've heard the expression, those who control the terms of debate control the debate. And so often people have in mind a vision of what the good life is. And then we project that onto Jesus and his beatitudes, the, the blessed life or the honorable life. And when I think of the honorable life and the blessed life in terms of Jesus, it looks very different from how the world looks at it. I mean, just put Jesus in the context in which he uttered these words, you know, blessed are the meek. In the context of the Pax Romana, people wouldn't have been thinking that blessed are the meek really are gonna be the ones who inherit the earth. It would have been the Roman government. It would be the Roman system. And we have the Pax Americana and all that. And it's like the meek, the meek aren't going to inherit the earth. No, but for Jesus, the meek will inherit the earth. It's not the mighty. It's not those who run over you. Or blessed are the poor in spirit. We tend to think those who are haughty in spirit, those who are self-righteous, who are full of themselves, are truly the ones who are going to make it. But Jesus says, no, you need to be spiritually bankrupt if you really want to live the blessed or honorable life. And Jesus defines that. And as we participate in him and as he calls us to himself, we are honored because of our union with Christ Jesus. And, and as we enter more and more fully into that reality and we embody more and more what we're united with him in, namely his character, his calling, his story, his very being through the Spirit, it reshapes our vision, it reshapes our persons, it reshapes our engagement of the church and the society at large. And so Jesus reorients us to help us understand anew what the good or the blessed or the honorable life is. And Jesus needs to be the one for the, the Christ follower who defines the terms and not myself, not me, my lonesome I, but Jesus needs to do that more and more in my life and in and his followers' lives in the context of a society where it all too often the good life looks very different. St. Augustine gives us an account of three types of people when he thinks about the blessed life and uh, the happy life, the honorable life. And one type of person is the tortured soul. This is the type of person who actually sees the good life, sees the blessed or honorable life, uh, but cannot possess it. Uh, it's like someone behind bars and it's right there, and that's the state of their soul. They're tortured. 
Uh, a second type of person is the cheated soul. This is the person who actually thinks they have the good, the honorable life, the blessed life, the happy life, but they don't. It's fake or it's far, far from really truly becoming blessed. But they think they're living the blessed life and they're cheating themselves. The third type of person is the diseased soul. This is someone who doesn't seek the good life or someone who actually uh, has the good life but doesn't even realize that they have the good life. Maybe it's a person who's always seen the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, so to speak. But the cheated soul, the diseased soul, the tortured soul, Jesus, while he's not in count, accounting necessarily for those three categories, maybe a whole assortment of categories including those, Jesus redefines for us what the good, blessed, honorable life is and it helps us, it heals us from having this cheated, tortured, diseased soul so that we truly have the blessed, honorable life in him.